being near their grandparents, etc. These are elements which promote the stability of marriage, the stability of communities, help to reduce crime. There's another phenomenon blamed for the fall in social capital, and it's staring you right in the face. Television. If someone asked me, how can I be happier? I would say, yeah, turn off the television and spend a little more time with friends. Actually, you will be happier. The evidence is just overwhelming. I've often said it is brain. But hold on. We get huge pleasure from the TV, don't we? It's our number one source of entertainment. No. No. Actually, don't get huge pleasure. Tele watching television is not greatly pleasurable, but it's, but it's a very attractive entertainment because it's extremely easy. Click. It's on. The effect of watching a lot of television is actually faintly depressing, both psychologically and physiologically. In the remote Himalayan kingdom of Bhutan, the government is pledged to take account of gross national happiness in every decision it takes. In 1999, they agreed, for the first time, to let TV into the country. This is made out of yak butter. Over yak butter tea, I met a family who told me what it was like when Bhutan joined the rest of the world. I imagine when television arrived, it must have been a huge shock for people. Yeah, it, it was a big shock for most, most of the people in Bhutan. It, it just came in and it, it's just not one or two, two channels that came in. There were about 99 channels that came in. Straight away, 99 yeah. channels. Bang. When the TV arrived, traditional family life departed. Usually they, they uh, sit spend their time talking mm. family family, yeah, family meals yeah. yeah is but that all gone that's all gone now even like sometimes my uh, niece and nephew they watch tv while eating so right. they don't tv sit dinner there. yeah tv dinner the tv <coughs> dinner's arrived in bhutan yeah oh i'm i'm sad about that <laughs> fixated by hindi soap operas grandmother says she's become a tv addict so much so that she neglects to pray Sometimes she even forgets to cook when the program is so interesting. <laughs> so worried were people about the effect of TV on Bhutan's happiness that a number of channels have been banned. The telly's been blamed for rising crime and bad behavior. One reason has to be uh, with um, the uh, way in which children are glued to television and are less inclined to do their homework less inclined to socialize among themselves. So they have taken away some of these rather captivating programs like the World Wrestling Federation. Yes, wrestling has gone, so has MTV. The local news station, though, is regarded as a positive force. They wanted only news channels, they wanted nature channels like National Geography, Discovery and all those. They're going to meet again and they're going to further cut down also. Really? You yes. think there'll be further cuts? Yes, yes, because the last meeting, uh, as I said, I was attending for two days and uh, they decided to keep it with 25 to 30 uh, for the moment. And maybe, uh, yeah, they were discussing that in the next meeting they will be cutting down, especially on the Indian TV soaps. It also supports financial Soap's bad, news good. At least that's what they think in Bhutan. But what does the science of happiness suggest? Watching the news or watching public affairs programming is actually good for your civic health. But most Americans, at least, don't watch public affairs. Most Americans watch friends rather than having friends. And that entertainment television is lethal. So what should we do to rebuild that sense of community that's so important for our happiness? We can't ban TV, and we can't force people to make friends. But we can make it easier. Swivel. And in Portsmouth, the council's got a team charged with boosting the city's social capital. Breathing in, breathing out. You can call it what you want, but it's about putting glue back into those communities for people to look after each other and generally to be a happier place to live. Stroke tiger breathing in. 
people have actually got friends and neighbours who they can interact with, people are going to be happier. This is one of their schemes. Tai Chi for the over 60s. I don't like bloody rabbits. <laughs> I think the worst thing is isolation. And I think isolation really kills more people than anything else because they're on their own with nobody to speak to. And as long as they can come and meet a group of people and have a laugh, that's a tonic. <laughs> During the summer, we go out on the little blue bus. We don't go far. We just go to little trips out, and we're all a nice little group to get on well together. And we have fun as well. The council in Portsmouth has decided it makes sense to offer happiness on the rates. It saved my life, really. Friendship has been fantastic. I see them outside the Wednesday Club. It's been a lifesaver, really. It's not just a little blue bus, it is it's sometimes very blue. <laughs> Being happy actually saves money. If people are happier, people are going to live longer, depend less on health, social care services. So there are loads of benefits. Happy people cost less. <laughs> The idea of promoting community to boost happiness is not new. A century ago, Baden-Powell gave us the Scouts, social capital with Gingangooli and a woggle. It took the world by storm, nowhere more than America. You got all these urchins running around and a guy comes to town and says, have I got a great idea for you? Shorts. Um, and beanies and little buttons and it's going to be just like the friends that Huck Finn had on the banks of the Mississippi River. That, I'm trying to make the Scouts seem like, as it is actually, a really interesting, nifty invention. The period between 1880 and 1910 saw an explosion in clubs and associations. The Football League has its origins from that time. But social capital's not always a source of happiness. The Ku Klux Klan has lots of social capital. So does Al-Qaeda. The old boys' network is built on the stuff. So social capital sometimes makes happiness and sometimes makes deep unhappiness. The question is why? There are, it turns out, two quite distinct kinds of social capital. One is about bonding within social groups. The other is about bridging between social groups. And what the scientists have concluded is that you need both types to make places happy. The society that has only bonding social capital and no bridging social capital looks like Beirut or Belfast, or Bosnia, that is, tight communities, but isolated from one another. Last year's disturbances in Birmingham saw a tight-knit Asian community in conflict with a tight-knit black community. Here you have uh, two communities who more or less faced each other across a single road. Uh, they are communities which have high levels of internal bonding, but actually there wasn't and is very little bridging between these two communities and I think this is a perfect demonstration of what happens when people who are very different look very different and think they are very different never uh, touch never interact it is an uncomfortable conclusion from the happiness data but multicultural communities tend to be less trusting and less happy we've done work here which shows that people, frankly, when there aren't other pressures, like to live within a comfort zone which is defined by you know, racial sameness. And that's why, of course, people tend to live in ghettos, pockets of sameness marked by colour or class or creed. 
My grandmother knew that. My grandmother told me birds of a feather flock together. What she meant was bridging social capital is harder to build than bonding social capital. People feel happier if they're with people like themselves. But the question is, what does like themselves mean? Ashton-under-Lyme on the edge of Manchester has two highly bonded communities, a working-class white community and a poor Asian community. In the past, crossing the road could mean entering enemy territory. I think there would have been a lot of attention. One young person walking across there probably would have got beat up. They'd be all out war, <laughs> basically. Um, they didn't tend to meet across the, the areas, but if they did, um, it was more about turf wars than anything else, um, if they did meet. They needed bridging capital badly, so they came up with the Ashton All-Stars and Oxford Park. Both communities shared a love of football and were united by the under-12s Tameside Sunday League. The idea of the football clubs was um, that it was a way of bringing the community to get together, but in a fun and energetic way. Uh, a lot of the young people are confident now uh, to walk across and use that park or any of the area. Um, and the young people have be are beginning to mix in uh, pretty well in especially the sports activities. People are a lot happier um, because when you know people, you feel safer within your own area. So, so yeah, it's, it's doing the community the world of good. We can find a moment, an idea, an activity which takes us out of our ethnicity and connects us to other people of different ethnicities. And if only for an hour in a week, then I think we can crack this problem. They needed to crack a similar problem two and a half thousand years ago in ancient Greece. The Greek Empire was made up of warring cities, but their differences were put to one side while they competed in the Olympics. This helped bind them together. A century ago, the problem was how to reduce tensions between new nation states. The Olympics were invented again. The gold medalist, the Olympic champion. And now, international sport is still seen as vital for a nation's happiness. In an increasingly fragmented world, there is a critical need to bind people together across class, colour and creed. I think the most important challenge facing all Western societies over the next 20 or 30 years is to create renewed bonds of solidarity, renewed sense of shared national uh, purpose. Which brings us back to Portsmouth. Here they found that shared purpose during the war. But to achieve lasting happiness, we need to create the bonding without the bullets. Next week, can technology make us happy? Could robots provide the friendship we need? Or is happiness a click away in cyberspace? And as the government builds a million new homes, has anyone mixed joy in with the mortar? If you want to find out more about happiness, visit our website, bbc.co.uk slash happinessformula. formula